We want to turn now to coverage from our Pittsburgh station, KDKA. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ken Rice, along with KDK political editor John Delano. It is primary election night in Pennsylvania, and KDK is bringing you live coverage here on CBS News Pittsburgh. The polls just closing now at 8 p.m. Results are going to start coming in shortly. And, you know, we're keeping an eye on all of the races, but, of course, we're especially watching the race for U.S. Senate and Pennsylvania governor, as well as congressional races to replace Mike Doyle and Connor Lamb, both of whom have chosen not to run for re-election. And, John, right off the bat here, we are delighted to be welcoming CBS News Executive Director of Elections and Surveys, Anthony Salvanto, joining us now. Anthony, it's great to be able to speak with you on a big, big night for Pennsylvania. First of all, let's, let's get your take on turnout. You know, there have been such, there's been such a barrage of advertising that if you were to turn on the TV in Pittsburgh or in Philadelphia or Erie, you might think, oh my goodness, the entire state is riveted. They're going to have a massive turnout. What, what are you expecting? I, I think it is going to be strong. Ken, and it's great to join you tonight. One of the things we've been doing as we monitor turnout today is right now we're estimating that election day turnout is going to be about 2 million. Then you add that to the roughly 600,000 mail ballots that have already been cast. So we're going to end up, I think, around 2.6 million in our current estimates. Now, that's not going to be a majority of registered Dems or Reps, but it is going to go past the last midterm. So in that respect, yes, it has been strong. And all that advertising, all that campaigning that you mentioned at the top there appears to be driving pretty strong turnout, very strong turnout, I should say, Ken. Anthony, let me ask you, when the Republican votes start to come in, what are you looking for? What do you want to see across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? Great question. Good to talk to you, John. And the first thing I want to show you, this is where registered Republicans live. And the darker areas, the darker shaded counties, have a relatively higher proportion of registered Republicans versus other voters. Now, there's still numerically a lot in Pittsburgh and in the Philadelphia suburbs. But one of the things you'll notice is that these darker areas, John, they're, they're all in the in the T. They're all in the central Pennsylvania area, a little bit up north. They're a little bit more rural, but they're going to add up. I think that's going to be very important. We're going to wait to see a lot of the patterns that emerge out of there. And then we are going to go not only around you and Pittsburgh, but then also the Philadelphia suburbs, where numerically, yes, they're sort of known for voting to leaning Democratic, but there are still hundreds of thousands of Republicans there. So we're probably in a race this close going to need to see a lot of patterns out of a lot of these counties, John. You know, I'm just going to note that uh, Allegheny County, Greater Pittsburgh, has more Republicans than any single county across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Although you're quite right, the collar counties around Philadelphia, when you add them up, the Montgomery, the Bucks counties, the Delaware and Chester counties, they outnumber Allegheny County in the West by far in the Republican primary. All true. All true. Anthony, so let's go ahead and look at talk the, about the Democrats. I was just sure yeah, you, you read our minds. Yes. <laughs> Great minds. Well, yeah, let me show you this because you're going <laughs> to you're going to see a little bit of a different pattern. Now, you mentioned Allegheny County, so I will start there for you, John. Yes. Look how blue the, the, the Pittsburgh area. Look how blue Allegheny is right here. That's because it's got, like you mentioned, and here's the numbers, nearly half. The, the proportion for registered Democrats. That's very high, comparable to the rest of a lot of the counties in the state. And then, yes, what you mentioned, I can illustrate for you right here. You've got the counties around Philadelphia, perhaps no surprise, Philadelphia itself, very dense blue, a lot of Democrats there, nearly 80 percent on the registration. But that's the other thing we're really going to watch. When we get start to get estimates out of Lancaster, out of Burks, Bucks, etc., that's where you're really going to start to see whether or not this race is going to be a projection, whether or not we're going to know a winner. And, you know, if Pennsylvania's history is any guide, that could be a little bit later tonight. It may not be quick, but we'll watch it, John. And, and Anthony, when the results are in, sorry if I stepped on no, you. No, no, go right ahead. When all the results are in, what will tonight's results from Pennsylvania mean going forward? Why is there so much attention nationally on Pennsylvania tonight? 
Well, two big reasons. One is that Pennsylvania is going to be such a pivotal state in control of the Senate, which is going to be closely contested come November. That's number one. Number two is it's another data point in looking at how the voters in a primary electorate, who tend to be more ideological than voters as a whole, how they pick a candidate and whether that candidate can then stand up and win in a larger, more moderate November electorate. And that, you know, in particular on the Republican side, there's going to be a majority of Republicans who've told us who are primary voters, they want to see candidates who are loyal to former President Trump. They think it's at least somewhat important to talk about what they see as issues in the 2020 vote. Those are all things that Republicans want, but is that going to play in the general election when voters tell us that it's inflation on their minds, that's the economy on their minds? Those are big questions that are partly raised by who the parties nominate tonight, guys. You know, Anthony, uh, those of us out in the field have great admiration for you and the CBS team when it comes to calling elections. So can you share with us uh, maybe some of the secrets with our viewers? How is it you go about calling an election for one winner or another? Absolutely. Um, I love to talk about this because what happens at our election desk is, a desk is we look for patterns. When I started talking about county after county just before, what we're going to see is, is a candidate performing consistently well in a lot of places? Is a candidate performing consistently against the number of potential voters? That is, the voter registration there. Do they get high turnout? And it's only when we see consistent patterns from county after county that we start to get a feel for who's ahead. And then we do another little bit of math. We say, OK, who's behind and can they catch up? Is there enough outstanding vote left out of all the votes to be counted? What percentage of that would they need to catch up and make up the difference? If that's a huge number, if it's like, you know, 60, 70 percent, well, that tells you that the trailing candidate can't make it. But if it's very close, if it's only, you know, they only need to get about half the vote to catch up, then you've got a much more competitive race. Those are the ways that we look at this as the votes come in. And that's ultimately how we know that we're certain somebody's going to win. It may be a late night and a night like this. If the polls are right and that Republican race is within one or two points, that may take a while. But that's how we do it. It's an election right. night. We'll sleep tomorrow. <laughs> Anthony <laughs> Salvanto, CBS News. News. Put on more coffee. <laughs> CBS News Director of Elections and Surveys. Great to get your insight. Thanks so much, Anthony. All right, John, let's talk about uh, the biggest race, that, has, in, at least in terms of uh, news coverage and right. attention worldwide, the race for the Republican nomination for U.S. Senate. Pat Toomey's given up the seat. Uh, Mehmet Oz gave up his TV show, his national TV show, to run. People said, wait a minute, this guy's from New Jersey. He says, well, I grew up right outside the Philadelphia media market. And then Dave, in Delaware. Right, right. In Delaware. Uh, but he says you know, his in-laws, I guess he used his in-laws address right. to register to vote. Dave McCormick, who says, well, I was born in Pittsburgh. I grew up in, I guess, Bloomsburg area. Right. Uh, but he's lived in Connecticut for the past 10 or, or 12 years. Um, so here are these people who clearly sensed an opportunity. Yes. I mean, Oz could have run for Senate in New Jersey. He could have waited for that opportunity, but he chose to run here. So, Well, Pat neither one of these guys was running for the U.S. Senate a year ago. Until I, Pat Toomey said until he Pat wasn't. Until Pat Toomey right. said he wasn't. So right. do you feel like the, the, the residency issues, um, it, it's perfectly legal, right? They don't oh, have yeah. to live in Pennsylvania until... Until the day of the election. That day. <laughs> that day. So what's become of that issue? Is it people still... You know, it really, this is an issue for Republican voters to sort through. But it is one of the issues that I think people are considering when they decide who to vote for in November. I think one of the reasons that Kathy Barnett has had some support is, the, is frankly that she's perceived as more Pennsylvania. But even she comes and she admits she's from the state of Alabama, although years ago. Yep. So, you know, I don't know that we have a litmus test of that you have to be a 100 percent Pennsylvanian to be a United States senator. I think almost everyone who becomes an elected official has roots elsewhere at one time or another. So we'll see whether that's really important. They, you know, the, the interesting thing was we thought that would be made an issue in the campaign, but it wasn't on television, at least, because neither Oz nor McCormick wanted to make it an issue. That's right. That's right. So they talked about everything else, right. but they never talked about residency. Okay, so uh, former President Trump comes out and endorses Oz, 
And there's a split here because we just had Ted Cruz in town, a big supporter of the pres of the former presidents, supporting Dave McCormick. And others in the Republican Party have said, you know what, President Trump, you got it wrong because they don't see Oz yeah. as being conservative enough. Well, that's exactly right. And the fact that they feel that Oz is not a strong candidate for a general election. And so, you know, privately, when I think about all the text messages I've gotten from insiders in the Republican Party, party strategists and the like, um, there's a lot of concern about whether Dr. Oz would be the strongest Republican nominee this fall. Now, you can make some of the same arguments against, uh, you know, a CEO hedge fund billionaire from Connecticut and Dave McCormick. So they, you know, McCormick has stressed his Pennsylvania roots. He's done everything he could on that score. But uh, it, it's really clear to me that uh, President Trump doesn't have the unified party in Pennsylvania that he may have thought. He may have, however, enough support to bring Mehmet Oz over the finish line. And that's one of the things that we're really going to watch tonight. I think it's going to be really interesting. Kathy Barnett was asked recently uh, what she made of Trump's endorsing, endorsement of Oz. She said of Trump, quote, he's not Jesus, so he gets to be wrong. And on this, he's wrong. And there's, like we said, there's a lot of Republicans who feel right. that Trump uh, should not have endorsed Oz. Uh, we have Erica Stanish is uh, live at David McCormick's headquarters. We're going to join her uh, she's going to join us, I should say. We'll join each other. Erica, it's nice to see you. You're, at, uh, you're in East Liberty at the Hotel Indigo. What's going on there so far tonight where Dave McCormick hopes to be celebrating a victory later? Yeah, that's right. And family and friends, supporters, they're all slowly starting to arrive here. Um, this started around 7.30, but the polls closed just at 8. So anybody that was going out to do some voting uh, last minute, that's what they were doing before heading over here. And McCormick himself has not made it yet either. But we were told uh, just after 8 o'clock, it's 10 after 11 or 10 after 8, rather. So we'll see when he shows up and what he has to say. But all eyes are on this Senate race tonight to succeed retiring Republican Pat Toomey. And the Republicans, as you mentioned, they want to keep the seat. And it appears that McCormick, celebrity Dr. Oz, and Kathy Barnett could be close for the nomination. Like many midterm GOP candidates, McCormick is running on the America First platform and advocating for policies started under former President Trump. And according to his campaign site, he plans to cut taxes for the working class and restore manufacturing jobs. But again, uh, supporters are just beginning to arrive here this evening, so we are waiting to see what he has to say when he does get here. And as those results start coming in, we'll be sure to keep you posted as that happens. Okay, Erica, thanks very much. And John, of the Republicans running for U.S. Senate, McCormick does have the, he can make the strongest claim to getting and understanding Pittsburgh because of his years here running yes. free markets. Yes, absolutely. He was born in Washington County. Uh, they moved fairly quickly out of Washington County up to Bloomsburg, where the family has been from for many years. Uh, but he returned to Pittsburgh to become CEO of a company called Free Markets, and he was the head of that company. And there, you're going to—if he's the nominee, you're going to hear a lot about what happened at that company in terms of jobs, one way or the other. One of the advantages that Dave McCormick has in this election, in my view, is that next to his name on the ballot, it says Allegheny County. He's the only candidate from Allegheny County running for the U.S. Senate. And I think that's a huge advantage for this region, at least. Yeah. He left the hedge fund, sold the home in Connecticut, and purchased a home in, in the city. Yeah, in yeah I think end. he still owns, he may own still the home in Connecticut. Okay. I'm not sure about okay. that. But He's he got it. about five or six homes. Okay. Just as we all do. Um, <laughs> So, um, Kathy Barnett, you mentioned her late surge in the polls. She is going to be in Lancaster County tonight with, um, with her election night crowd, hoping to celebrate victory. Carrie Corrado from our sister station in Philadelphia, KYW, is there. We are at the Star Barn here in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. This is home of the Kathy Barnett campaign. People are starting to filter in now. Behind me is a look at that stage. Barnett voted at the Huntington Valley Library in Montgomery County. She has been fighting hard to secure the GOP Senate nomination. Political experts saying she came out of nowhere, an underdog who surged to the top late in the game and with far less money. She's now battling frontrunner Dr. Oz, who was endorsed by former President Trump, and David McCormick, who was also also a top contender. On primary eve, her camp addressed photos she was in D.C. when the Capitol was attacked. Her campaign told CBS Barnett had no involvement in violence. So all eyes are on the Keystone State, not only here, but nationwide. I'm Kerry Carano. Back to you. All right, Kerry Carano, thanks. You know, not only did President Trump endorse Oz, but he went negative on Barnett, saying there's no way she could win the general election. 
Yes, and I, that may be premature. I mean, Kathy Barnett, I've interviewed her a number of times. She's genuine. She's real. Uh, she's very, very, very conservative. And so she fits the Donald Trump mold. And I think ultimately Donald Trump will be backing if Kathy Barnett wins the primary tonight. Uh, Donald Trump's going to be uh, really with her all the way. So I think it's a little premature to uh, suggest uh, that she can't win a November election. OK, let's shift to the, uh, the right, <coughs> right side of the screen there and look at the Democratic candidates for U.S. Senate. John Fetterman, the lieutenant right. governor, former Senate candidate back in 2016, right. uh, running strongly this time. Polls have shown him with a, a fairly comfortable lead from the get-go, right? Yes, absolutely. You know, more than 20, 25 points in some cases. And uh, I, part of it is the name recognition. Fetterman's been around the horn. This is his third statewide race. This is a very big commonwealth, and it's very hard to get name ID. But the smartest thing he did, I think, was hold these marijuana conferences in each of the 67 counties to determine whether particular counties wanted to back legalizing recreational use of marijuana. That put him in every single county. It created a connection for, with real people for John Fetterman. And I think Fetterman's strength has always been that he's just not like anybody else in That's politics. True. He's That's different. True. And people love that. They want difference, you know. Vive la difference. He's 6'8", and uh, he favors hoodies and gym shorts. and right. uh, Even when meeting the President of the United States, sure. he wears those uh, shorts. Of and, his. and he says, you know what, people like that he's a regular dude. So Fetterman, as we've been reporting, suffered a stroke yes, uh, late last week. Uh, he almost immediately put out a video with his wife uh, saying that he's recovering well. Uh, and then more news today, we got word that he was having a uh, defibrillator implanted to correct uh, or to protect against AFib. Yeah, this is a pacemaker. It's very common. It's not an unusual surgery. A lot of folks have had pacemakers. They work very well. Um, and they had a video of him voting today. And, you know, I texted with him over the weekend. There's no indication that there's any, any cognitive or physical disability as a result. But on the other hand, you do want to take care of your health. And so right. it's not surprising to me that he's not back here campaigning or holding a victory party. His wife's going to do that, assuming he wins tonight. Any impact at all, do you suppose, this medical news happening right in the closing days? You know, I don't think so. I think people have been pretty set on whether they're voting for Connor Lamb or for John Fetterman or Malcolm Kenyatta or Alex Khalil, if you're from Montgomery County. And, and I don't think it made much of a difference. Some people think, oh, maybe there was a little sympathy vote out there. I'm not even sure of that. I think, uh, frankly, I think this election was pretty set in stone. Connor Lamb, seen as a rising star in the Democratic Party. The whole nation was watching his race against, against Rich, uh, Rick Saccone, um, and he was able to defeat him and then defeated Keith Rothfuss. Did Connor Lamb underperform in your estimation? Well, there's been some criticism of his campaign, the fact that they were not as strong and visible and out there. Part of the problem for uh, Congressman Lamb was I think he waited too long to announce. But that wasn't entirely his fault. He was waiting to see whether Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan from back east, who was thought to be a very strong uh, congresswoman with, with lots of money, was going to enter the Senate race. And it wasn't until <laughs> she said she was not going to run that Connor Lamb said he would. But it was late in the day, and I think he's, he struggled to raise the money uh, and become as visible and as well known as John Fetterman is. Um, I think he has a great future. You know, he's young, he's in his mid 30s, he's a former prosecutor, he could either practice law, he could run for Attorney General of Pennsylvania. I mean, I can think of lots of other yeah. offices for him if he chooses to do so. Okay, and you know what? I'm, as I'm asking these questions, I'm thinking maybe let's not get ahead of ourselves because there's zero percent of the vote. That's right. I'm he just could these, still win these it. questions <laughs> are just based on polling, which, as we certainly know, can be imperfect. All right, let's move ahead to the race for governor of Pennsylvania. Tom Wolf, term limited, can't run right. again. Right. So the seat is open. And if I had told you, John, that a, a year ago, <laughs> that the front runner for the Republicans would be a guy named Doug Mastriano. What would you have told me? I, I, <laughs> there was no way anyone would believe that a fellow who had busloads of people going to the January 6th rally or insurrection, take your pick, would somehow be the Republican, the leading Republican candidate for governor of Pennsylvania. Uh, Doug Mastriano is a very interesting story. He's a 30-year veteran of the Army, a colonel. Uh, he was only recently elected state senator. He has very limited political experience as a state senator uh, taking office in 2019. 
Um, he led the effort in the state Senate to overturn the 2020 election, saying that Donald Trump won Pennsylvania, not Joe Biden. Um, so he's, he's really uh, out there. And no surprise, Donald Trump endorsed him over the weekend. But I just think uh, he has not only surprised pundits and, and political prognosticators, he has surprised the establishment Republican Party. And again, they are going a bit apoplectic mm -hmm. over the concern that Doug Mastriano is going to be the Republican nominee. Again, we don't know that he's going to be, but the polls show him well ahead. Lou Barletta, Congressman, former Congressman Lou Barletta, who, by the way, was co-chair of Donald Trump's campaign in 2016. And still couldn't get his endorsement. And still yeah. couldn't get Trump's endorsement. A lot of Republicans in the last week coalesce behind Lou Barletta, but it's hard to know whether the congressman has a shot at knocking off the state senator. Yeah, a lot of Republicans feel that he's just too far to the right. State Senate Republican leader Kim Ward of Hemfield says that there's no way Mastriano can attract the moderate voters that he would need to win right. in November. And, you know, with the Roe v. Wade draft opinion coming out, so much attention on the abortion issue, the head of the PA pro-life coalition said that Mast Mastriano gets their top rating because yep. he supports a complete ban on abortion with yeah. no exceptions. No exceptions at all. But Mastriano says, uh, but uh, the, the, co the pro-life coalition says, in their view, he would get clobbered by Josh Shapiro in the general election. Josh yeah. Shapiro, we should say, state attorney general running unopposed tonight. Yeah, you know, this is, again, what, what I'm hearing from Republican insiders. But again, this is the sort of the establishment Republican. And the question is whether or not there are a lot of folks in the Republican Party, just as there are in the Democratic Party, that are looking for these non-conventional, these different kind of politicians or maybe non-politicians. Mastriano may have an appeal to that group, and uh, we'll see tonight, uh, well, we'll certainly see whether he gets nominated. I think the race between, uh, jo if it is Josh Shapiro and Doug Mastriano, it's going to be hard fought. There's going to be a lot of money. It's, the Mastriano campaign knows all about grassroots. He, you know, let's face it, if he wins this, he's won it without money. Yeah. Because he did not go on television. We didn't see, now we did see... But Mastriano adds that Josh Shapiro ran. Yeah, different category. You yeah, know, but right. uh, that's it. So what do you make of this? It seems like a very late effort on the part of some of the of some of Mastriano's rivals to coalesce behind Lou Barletta. Yeah. sort of a last chance to deny Mastriano the nomination. Yeah, well, that's what I was saying. I'm, I, I would think it's too little too late, to be honest. I think it's hard to do in the last week of a campaign. You know, you ha still have Jake Corman, who endorsed Lou Barletta. You have uh, State Senator, President Pro Tem of the State Senate. And former Congresswoman Melissa Hart from our area dropped out and endorsed Lou Barletta. But here's the problem. Their names are on the ballot. Right. You know, they dropped out so late right. that their names are on the ballot. I bet you Melissa Hart gets a bunch of votes because people know her around here. All right, John, let's move on to these uh, interesting races for Congress. Mike yeah. Doyle retiring in yeah. the 12th District. So this is the city of Pittsburgh, part of the South Hills, part of uh, Mon Valley, and a little bit of Westmoreland County. Right. Mike Doyle is endorsing Steve Irwin, seen as a relatively moderate Democrat. Summer Lee, however, has been, um, is well known as a member of the state legislature. Uh, how do you see this race playing out? Well, this is a very hard one to predict. Uh, you know, Steve Irwin is a progressive Democrat, but he's not a socialist. He's not quite as liberal or progressive as Summer Lee is. And uh, no surprise, the main Democratic establishment has really coalesced behind Steve Irwin. And once again, if it's a low turnout primary, I expect the liberals, the ultra liberal progressive socialists, to be out there voting for Summer Lee, and she could win this election simply because her supporters are more fervent than Steve Irwin's. I mean, that remains to be seen, but uh, I think this is a close election. I've talked to Democratic insiders over the last couple days. They think the momentum is with Steve Irwin. It was with Summer Lee, but the attacks on Summer Lee may have worked and may have been sufficient uh, to convince a number of Democrats that Summer Lee is is, uh, you know, she's part of the AOC crowd. That's what they'll say, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the squad, yeah. the very, very progressive women in the U.S. House that she would become part of. They're basically saying that uh, that just, that's not Pittsburgh. That might be, you know, that might be the Bronx and Brooklyn and New York and other parts of the country, yeah. but it's not Pittsburgh. Well, we'll find out.
We'll just find out in a few minutes, I think, uh, who's won that race. Okay, so that's uh, the Democratic race to replace Mike Doyle. On the Republican side, uh, no competition for Mike Doyle. That's no <laughs> no relation to the ex yeah. soon-to-be exiting Congress. Yeah, this, this is a very strategic move. <laughs> uh, Plum Borough Councilman Mike Doyle, no relation to Congressman Mike Doyle. This one's a Republican Mike Doyle. He's running in the general election, and he will take on either Steve Irwin or Summer Lee or Jerry Dickinson, for that matter, if he were to win the primary. So uh, and you're gonna, there's going to be a lot of confusion yes. about that, but we'll talk about that after the election. Reminds me of the, the Casey confusion, the Remember real the Bob Casey, Casey the back real in the Bob 1980s. Casey. Right. All right, let's move on. 17th Congressional District, Connor Lamb choosing to run for Senate instead of running for re-election. Right. Uh, let's talk about the Democratic side. This is Beaver County uh, plus parts of Southern and Northern Allegheny County. Yep, up into the Allegheny Valley. This uh, district is a toss-up district. This district could vote Republican this fall. It could vote Democratic. The Democrats have uh, two candidates to choose between, Chris Deluzio and Sean Malloy. Neither one is very well known. They've run a campaign. They've sent out mailings. They've got signs up. Uh, but they have not really advertised on television. One of these two will be the Democratic nominee. And then on the Republican side, you've got three candidates running, Kathy Coder, Jason Kilmeyer, and Jeremy Schaefer. Schaefer has some name recognition because he's the guy who unseated State Senator Randy Volokovich in a very bitter state Senate race. Two Republicans running against each other. Schaefer, a real conservative, said Volokovich was too liberal a Republican. He defeated Volokovich in the primary, but then went on to lose to State Senator Lindsey Williams. It's very interesting primaries for both. One of these individuals is going to be the next congressperson from this district. Right. Uh, we talked briefly uh, at the top of this program with Anthony Salvanto about the significance of Pennsylvania tonight, why so many people are watching it, and particularly the race for U.S. Senate, because of the balance of power in the U.S. Senate. Yes. So Pat Toomey giving up a Republican seat, and that throws the potential majority into question. It really does, and it allows the Democrats a chance for a pickup in a seat that, uh, in a state that's really purple. There's no predicting who's going to win, but the Democrats think they have a great shot at carrying Pennsylvania this year for the U.S. Senate. Uh, again, we don't know who the nominees on both sides are, uh, but I can guarantee you that uh, you, we haven't seen the last of these ads. There's been millions of dollars spent in the primary. Double it for mm. the general election. Mm. Tens of millions, Tens of just millions. by McCormick and Oz alone. Um, all right, I'm going to hit you with a curveball here. Is there any correlation, have you ever noticed in your many years of observing politics, whether you can judge the energy on a primary night and whether that will have some influence in the general election that follows? For instance, if we have five or six additional points for, let's say, for one of the two parties tonight, does that mean anything in November? No. No, in terms of turnout and result, no. In ter yeah, in terms no. of the in terms of the um, the energizing of the of no. the no, yes. because you know issues that are going to be important in November are not as important intra-party elections. For example, take the abortion issue. The whole question of abortion rights and pro-life, pro-choice, and all of this stuff. This would not be an, that's not an issue in these primaries. All the Republicans are pro-life. They call themselves pro-life. All the Democrats call themselves pro-choice. So, you know, it's not an issue. But come fall, it's going to be a huge issue, I think, in Pennsylvania, because this is one of the, again, one of the states where, where it's closely divided on the abortion issue. You can run through a number of issues, education issues on, on uh, you know, uh, the critical race theory stuff and, and the transgender issues. These are not issues that tend to split Democrats, but they will split voters in a November election. Right. So this is a whole different ball game starting once we know the winners tonight. Just about a minute left here. I'm just thinking ahead to what the, the national commentary will be about this tomorrow. And it's definitely going to focus on President Trump's Absolutely. endorsed candidates, Doug Mastriano and Mehmet Oz. So yeah, Trump, he's either zero for two or yeah. you know, two, two and zero. We'll see. He's coming off, a big win, coming off a big win in Ohio where he endorsed J.D. Vance. And that was a very tight race. Yes, it was. And this one, although ultimately he won by uh, more than a few points in Ohio. But I don't know that this race could be very, very close. And I think one of the things, as Anthony Salvanto was telling us, this could take us a little while. It may not be quite as quick as many of us are hoping it is. So folks are going to have to stay tuned to uh, KDKA and 
rest of the news here for us to know the final results. When I saw you show up here today with a sleeping bag and a pillow, I knew <laughs> what you were thinking about tonight. It will yeah. be interesting. Yeah. And once again, as the results come in, uh, we'll be having them here. You can uh, check us out at kdk.com, where throughout the night we'll be updating all the latest election info as well. And there's more election, uh, primary election coverage coming up at the top of the hour right here on CBS News Pittsburgh, as well as on KDK TV. And again, anytime at kdk.com. For John Delano, so nice to have you here in person, John. Great to be here, A pleasure. Ken. You Thank should you. stop by more often. Uh, I'm Ken Rice. Thanks for being with us. You've been watching coverage from our Pittsburgh station, KDKA. On the Pennsylvania primaries, voters are casting ballots in the races for governor and U.S. Senate. For more, we want to turn now to coverage from our Philadelphia station, KYW. Well, good evening, CBS News Philly. I'm Natasha Brown. It is primary night in Pennsylvania. Polls are closed everywhere but Berks County, which had its hours extended to 9 p.m. by a court order. Now, the eyes of the nation are certainly on Pennsylvania right now, and the big race is being decided here. Joining us now from New York for more insight on primary election day 2022 is CBS News Director of Elections and Surveys, Anthony Salvanto. Good evening to you, Anthony, and thanks so much for joining us tonight. We appreciate Appreciate it. Hey, Natasha, great to talk to you. Well, you know, let's talk about voter turnout. I would assume it's obviously going to be a lot lower than you would have during a general election. Uh, but tell